Hi everybody, thanks very much for coming to another episode of From the Bottom Up. You may have noticed we've shifted from looking at um, funny or crazy world issues and using them to going into the depth. Now my life is the, is the bottom, <laughs> personal life, and we're going up into the spirit with the help of every week my guest, David. <laughs> I was going to say David Warwick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we really are good coming together here. <laughs> Look, I'm trying to learn to have my filter back in one second. But today I just, I really wanted to go into, I have a few topics in mind, but the core of it really is we had uh, a guest lecturer, Bob Rosenthal, came to our mystery school. Um last week for three, four days, and he really just went up there and shined his light and poured his heart out, but the original reason, I think we invited him and, and his gift and special, almost like a little mini special, special function within the realm of the Course in Miracles is he's a very trained uh, psychotherapist or psychologist that specialized in multiple personality disorders. And he calls it, or he made this video with this guy called DID, which is Dissociative Identity Disorder. And basically it's when four or five, or really multiple, like if you've seen the movie Split, up to 22, personalities can be in one body. You know, that's what they say, one body. Really, it's all in the mind. But the way they picture it is there's this one girl who's had a trauma when she was, say, four years old. It could be extreme trauma, like sexual abuse or or being beaten, and because they have no way of running, talking about it, or doing anything, the only defense mechanisms they have is they create an altar or another personality that 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 is the one that's getting abused. It's not them. It's happening to somebody else. And so, just give me a sec here so our studio can... Yeah, so it's happening to somebody else. And as they go along, that somebody else might even need somebody else to talk because they're so isolated and alone. <clears throat> so when Bob was talking about this, something in my heart just struck so deeply, and I don't know why, because nobody nobody really would have called me multiple personality or dissociative identity disorder. And yet, of course, within The Course in Miracles, Everybody is schizophrenic if they believe in the ego and, and creates up a personality for itself. And yet something within what Bob was talking about really touched me. And then, after we watched this movie Split, I was guided to, without knowing what it was, uh, the very next day watch a movie called Tully. Some of you may have seen it. And in Tully, this woman is very, very tired and she can't, she can't really rest or get sleep because she's trying to take care of her three kids and she asks for help and basically her brother, her biological brother, offers to buy her a nanny, a night nanny, so that she can rest and sleep and this night nanny comes and just really is really inspiring, talks with her, helps take care of the kids, takes care of the mother and the mother just, it's by Charlize Theron, she's the mother, she just starts getting happier and happier and happier until the end of the movie, I'm going to give away the end but I have to because from my show. So, <laughs> the end of the movie, you see that Tully was actually a character in her mind that the nanny never showed up. It was it was herself that was spending extra hours baking cookies and talking to herself and making her really happy. But but because it was an altar, she was still extremely tired. And the husband realized what was going on, and they really had to have a real shift. But then Bob went up there and talked at the mystery school and gave this beautiful talk to everybody and went into this in more depth. And while he was up there, Francis just kept hearing J my name, Jason, in this, while she was doing the talk, while he was doing the talk. And I, I just was blowing me away. And Kirsten would often tell me years ago, maybe I was like, a, <laughs> sorry, little Asperger's or something, <laughs> like just no filter or something. And and she, she says maybe it has something to do with the fact that, uh, I don't know if it's 
true <laughs> with the emotion, maybe. Something to do with, like, having an alcoholic mother that until six years old, both through the womb and everything, that there was a drinking, and I would describe it like I'd come home from school, and I would put my head near the door and just not listen with the ear, but listen telepathically, put my spiders in, and then, okay, who am I going to meet? Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, or the normal? And then whatever it was, you, I would respond accordingly with a personality that would allow me to feel safe. And there's no conscious memory of this, and I don't really understand as a baby what you would do. And ultimately, the Course says that really this goes way back, and it's a dissociation from who you are, and how many splits, it doesn't matter. But I kind of want to like know why does the Spirit keep presenting this this, this theory, this multiple personality disorder, and, and how do I use it? So, hmm. well, I think perhaps of all the diagnoses and all of the seeming thousands and thousands of diagnosis in terms of uh, psychological diagnosis, or we could even say diseases, um, whether it's in the DSM-3 or DSM-4 with psychological or just in the medical journals, um, there's probably no no disorder or disease that is a more helpful metaphor to the whole separation and, and what's going on with with the mind while it's asleep. I mean, it's one thing, a lot of people I know who have they've seen Split or back in the old days, we Sybil, you know, the multiple personalities. And, and then, you know, sometimes they would be fascinated by that, like, wow, that is a fascinating disorder. And they would want to read more. And then the more they read, the more intriguing it was, because uh, it starts to show that, as Jesus teaches, all illness is mental illness, and there is no such thing as a physical symptom, and no such thing as a physical disorder. On the surface of things, you know, if somebody told you that there were no physical disorders whatsoever, that would seem to fly in the face of a lot of history and a lot of evidence. Uh, the entire medical model, all of the medical, you know, progressions and diagnoses and treatments for centuries and then it would it would seem to dismiss all of that but but DID or multiple personality disorder when you really look at it you start to see that these distinct personalities that seem to inhabit a body uh, one could have heart disease or or cancer or a diseased liver or or whatever it's a skin pigmentation and then when it shifts into another personality, the heart disease is gone, the cancer disappears in an instant when they shift over to that personality or whatever. Uh, you know, then it's, that's the most obvious sense that the body and these so-called symptoms are just a projection. Almost like you're just changing the channel uh, on a remote control, and then on one channel you've got Shirley MacLaine in this one movie, and then in the next movie, she's a different character with different uh, personality, different, um, you know, look and so forth, and, you know, you go through all the the different uh, Shirley Mac MacLaine marathon, you know, you look at all these different characters, and and that's really what this world is, is it's, it's, a, it's a dissociation, trying to keep love and fear, two distinctively different thought systems, belief systems, apart by by some kind of device that keeps you so distracted from from bringing them together. And that's all the Course is, is bringing the darkness to the light, bringing the fear to the love. And so, when I look at the world, I, I think, you know, alter, as Bob was describing, it is like alternate personality, or alternate person. So we have seven billion alternates <laughs> that are all on the loose, all projections, of this desire to keep both love and fear in the mind, to keep a split mind, to keep the schizophrenia going and alive, when actually it's all just one mind. We're all the Christ mind. The separation has never occurred, and it's only this condition of dissociation in the mind that's that's where the intensity is of trying to maintain these, as they're both being real and true. And quite frankly, fear is not true. It never was created by God, God doesn't even know about it, so it, it certainly has no truth in it at all. And yet, the way you're describing your life, the way a lot of uh, DID 
people that are diagnosed is that there's these almost solid survival mechanisms, personalities that are like defense mechanisms or like masks that are worn to to bring a sense of safety, like to survive for for you, for your sister, for that crazy family. Like I don't know if it's the alcoholic mother or she's she's wild, she's this, she's that, and I need to keep a sense of stability. That that same thing is happening. There's a there's a wound there, and it's almost like this is a way of trying to bring stability into a very chaotic, um, wild world, and and that goes way back. Yeah, it's funny timing because uh, I actually just got a call from my aunt today. I was just telling you earlier, like six in the morning, and um, she just said my mother's been diagnosed non-small cell sar sarcoma, whatever, some kind of cancer. And she's been given three to six months to live, and I thought, wow, funny timing. And I even started talking to my aunt about this and, because she's like, "How do you feel? Do you have any emotions?" and I feel like long ago I've let go of the idea of seeing her or whatever, but there's still like, what's going on in my mind with, with her? And so I started telling my aunt, well, I'm, I've kind of let her go, but there is a feeling like, I don't know exactly what I said, but but that I'm, oh yeah, because she, she said about my brother, she said, I'm just worried about your brother, he's so volatile. <laughs> you met Andrew, he's, <laughs> you know, he's a little volatile. <laughs> And I said, well, you know, we've been exploring this thing called DID, and I think that there might just be these defense mechanisms that when love is there, because this is what Bob said, Bob said the only way that those altars come down, because what they do, as you see, is they put these barriers between them. The only way the barriers come down for the altars to kind of meet each other and then see that they're not needed and fall apart is to feel safe and loved. And so I was like, <laughs> that's all Andrew would need, or that's all... Yeah. you know, I would need. And she said, well, yeah, let's not just blame your mom. Your dad was crazy. <laughs> it, was, it was really funny. But I don't know. I don't know where it all fits in, but I, I still hit this place like, okay, is it just that metaphor or is there something the Spirit's really trying to show me? Like, I've been watching this altar of of the helper that would really try to arise strongly. Like, yesterday we went and saw Pope Francis, the man of his word, and and in that movie, you know, Pope, I don't know, you might want to really describe it, but the Pope is just, he's got these strong, like, sacrifice beliefs, but he's, he's trying to help the world in the best way he can, and he's like ten notches above all the other Popes in terms of his, his heart and his love. But I left the movie thinking, okay, I'm shifting topics, but I'm sure you're going to bring this up. I left this movie thinking, I have this, I feel like this mission in the ministry right now where as great as it is, you know, us elders have been together and communicating, high level communication, we've been using all the projects to heal, clean, whatever, and now we're like, we're not really inspired by that, but I'm inspired by giving that communication gift over, and yet we're all still kind of like making these decisions, and yet you have to give the decisions over for people to have practice with communication, so there's a transition that's to happen, like this. And it's so the, pe the resistance is down here with people that don't want to communicate, but do at the core. And there's resistance for letting go of communication. And there's like a strain in my mind as I'm trying to turn this, like it's all on me. And yet I'm inspired, and there's like an altar there. <laughs> <laughs> how, do, how does this get done by Jesus without any strain? Because you, you were so inspired after watching that movie with the idea of, like, Helen Shuckman, you know, she wrote in the Chorus that Jesus asked her, what do you do when you're in a desert? And she said, uh, she didn't know. He asked her again. She still didn't know. He said, leave. And, you know, if you feel any sense of the world means anything, you just have to, to leave. And I could feel that that was appropriate for you, and I'm ready for you to pop off any day. But <laughs> me, I don't know that leaving is the best answer. So yeah. kind of... It's kind of like the movie The Truman Show, you know, Truman knows there's something bigger and more. Even Sylvia, you know, breaks on the set and down, 
runs with him down to the beach, and then when her dad comes up in the car, Truman, it's all, it's all fake, it's all for you, it's all just a show, she's throwing sand, and she's going to pack into like 10, 15 seconds her whole message for Truman, like none of this is real. And uh, it's not though until he faces his fears, which fear of the water, and because his father seemed to drown, and all these associations, he takes the, the boat and he keeps sailing, sailing. Christoph, the ego, tries to drown him, you know, and, and he comes up not being drowned. Is that the best you can do? And he goes all the way till the front of the boat hits the edge of the, the, the set. It, before that, it looks like a horizon. He's, he, it looks very much like the sky until the beginning, the middle of the boat just goes boom through the set. And then, even then, he's reached something. And he still is, has to walk along the edge there until he finds the steps, until he finds the exit door, and he, until he actually pushes the exit door and, and the door opens. And then right away Kristoff comes in, you know, Truman, you can't leave, you know, you're the star of the show. Tries to use all the ego things, fame and notoriety and everything, to hold him in there. You, oh, you can't go. And then Truman's like in a place of, now he's found the exit door. So there's no hope for the ego. So he just kind of smiles and goes, yeah. And then, in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. That's the bow that you finally take in the end when you start to realize there is no external world. Nothing of the projections were true. There were no father, mother, sister, brothers. And, and yet, just like Bob talked about with, with treating those that have had a, a trauma, an abuse, a wound, you've got to bring the altars together. Doesn't that remind you of the Course? When you meet anyone, remember, it's a holy encounter. As you see him, right. you'll see yourself. Right. As you treat him, you'll treat right. yourself. As you think of him, you'll think of yourself. Never forget this, wow. for in him wow. you'll find yourself or lose yourself. So, the way Bob would treat DID patients, or multiple personality, is, is to bring all those different 5, 10, 20, 22 altars, you have to bring them together <laughs> and, and you have to see that there's no threat there. Because they were just a projection of the fear. Like, that, and if you look at 7 billion people on the planet, that's 7 billion different alternate personalities. Yeah. 7 billion different fake masks, fake personalities, fake news, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's all a construct and it's all asking for integration, for forgiveness, and even with your own relationships, you know, you know in your own life, and then also in terms of community, you can see there's lots of healing going on because we are getting back to that point where we, uh, the, basically, um, Frank was just mentioning on uh, the last step where, oh my gosh, I'm seeing I don't need to do anything at all. It's just let go. And let go of of any type of concern or attention for the screen. That's really what the let go is. Having that faith, that trust, that you can truly let it all go. Now in the case of your example of the ministry, it's still the helper mask, you know, I want to be a helper. And, and so that will be another thing that has to go by. It has to be let go of. Where you just merge in that presence of love and helpfulness and you start to see that that's just who you are. You, who you are as the Christ is helpful, just mm. being who you are. Mm. Not so much orchestrating something in time and space, or saving people, or, or helping people. You know, those are all steps along the way that the Spirit's using is when the mind's getting rinsed. But in the end, you, you have to see that your happiness, your joy, your peace of mind is is everything, and there is nothing else beyond that. But then I had this feeling I wouldn't talk, and then nothing would happen. <laughs> yeah, but nothing ever did happen. <laughs> D-I-D is did, we talked about. The doer, and the past tense of do is did, it's all undone, you know, in presence. And uh, even Eckhart Tolle, you know, talks about training teachers of presence. But in the end, you can tell that it's the presence that's the most important part. Mm -hmm. The teachers of presence are more just the symbol, the metaphor of 
bringing that love, bringing that light to every person, every situation. You know, that's that's just the metaphor. Mm. So it's like there is some kind of a deep, like retiring from the world, but retiring into the mind, seeing that it's all been a state of mind, that everything that seemed to be, have been done, both good, bad, right, and wrong, in terms of form, that was still that was still the alternate reality, which isn't mm. reality at all. It was just the play, the lila, mm. out there. But that that isn't the reality. Mm. So you do it does bring a sense of of deep rest mm. with it. That's amazing. It's beautiful because even just bringing awareness to this idea of altars. We like were out for dinner the other night with someone, and I I had a thought, and I thought I could share it. This might be helpful, but it was a test, and so I said it, and I was met back with. That is not helpful, you know? Mm -hmm. And then something in me, just like some kind of like rage or whatever, just arose and it took everything to not act from it and mm -hmm. just let it move through. And it was like the helper and the rage were like two sides of the same mm -hmm. yeah. coin or something. Yeah, it's yeah. really interesting. Yeah, I think another Canadian, <laughs> Jim Carrey, The Mask. <laughs> Could all, we could all watch the mask again, you know, and or me, myself, and Irene. Interesting movies, you know, that really deal with this idea of multiple personality. Me, myself, and Irene, you know, was was quite extreme, even though it was just mm -hmm. two. Mm -hmm. um, that that was enough. That was enough. <laughs> that was a full movie to deal with right there. But we're starting to realize that that's the, really the whole point of relationships too is is coming inside. And, and the wound that Bob talked about, like the abuse at a young age, is, is just a symbol for the belief in the fall from grace or the separation from God. That's the wound in the mind. That's where the seeming split mind comes in. And then, then all the distractions of the world and not, not talking heart to heart, like they were talking about in modern day mystics, you know, these mm -hmm. deep loving connections, not hiding anything, being very uh, open about everything. All those things that have been talked about really through all the shows this morning and, and uh, what Kirsten, Jeffrey, well, they're all coming to the point where we see that communication ends the, sp the perceived split and, and the felt split in the mind. So it's true communication. We're just learning to communicate honestly, lovingly, with true ideas from Christ, from the Holy Spirit, and then as we keep teaching what we would learn, we become more stabilized because we're more unified. Mm -hmm. And in the end, um, awakening is not a matter of more or less. You know, we can't even use, oh, I'm, I'm more loving and I'm more mm -hmm. healed and yeah. more, 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 because it's not, uh, healing is yeah. not really a matter of degree. You're either healed, you're lit, you're happy, you're, hap you're a happy dreamer and you're watching the world and you're not concerned with any of the dramas or any of the things of personalities, which were of course projected out mm -hmm. from the, the split. You, you transcend all of that, then you become exceedingly happy mm -hmm. and then that, that's what healing means. Yeah, yeah. To heal is to make happy. That's why we have to take our brother in, like you were saying, with the altars. Cause Everyone that Jesus sends to us is that altar and whatever barrier we put in yeah. between them. When we bring them, you know, maybe not with seven billion, because you maybe do ten and you've really got all seven billion in those ten. Or yeah, whatever. yeah. But that is, I mean, this is that's powerful. Yeah. Right? That's why people say, "Oh, it's a self-study course," and as if that means hang out in your apartment. They're missing the wonder of of that aspect. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah, the, the topic I think Diana talked about today too, of just of tuning into the guidance. The way you transcend this deeply rooted belief in sacrifice is just, just by following the guidance. The guidance always will be about true communication. You get deeper and deeper into that. And then ultimately there's a, there's a, a click in the mind where it's like it dawns, like, oh my gosh, that's what this was all for. It was never about all these specific things, different people, scenarios. The ego's projection is very complicated, but healing is not. Healing is very simple. But just the willingness to to follow that guidance without exception, you know, to to not 
hide behind one mask and put one front on for one person and then put another one on. Mm -hmm. A lot of us, you know, you talk about that in childhood, but even when we think of going to school and, and with our close friends, how we were and how with our parents and maybe at church we had a little bit different mask, you know, most people can relate to this, mm -hmm. uh, even if it wasn't a hugely traumatic childhood, they can still feel the nuances of how they they act differently around other people. The people pleasing yeah. is laid on there pretty thick. Do you know why? Like, I'm gonna have a personal question because <laughs> they're all. Are. Do you know why when I said that thing about the alcoholic mother, it's something just like so much emotion comes up? And then... I think probably because. Dissociation and keeping an unconscious mind takes enormous amount of energy. The mind is whole by its very nature. And so when you try to take what is whole and you break it into two parts, then that takes an enormous amount of energy to maintain that facade of a split mind. And so it's almost like your mind's just starting to feel the ease of ad admitting, you know, the first step, like in the 12 steps, you have to admit this is unmanageable, this world, this whatever I tried to do in the mm -hmm. past, absolutely unmanageable. And then maybe a sense of intensity and emotion and even a release just talking about mm -hmm. this because, you know, oftentimes people don't really see it. And when they do see it, they, they sometimes see it when they're talking to a therapist or a mm -hmm. dear friend, like, hmm. I think when I was a child, I was trying to keep it together, keep keep the family together, keep something together, and facing a very yeah. crazy, chaotic uh, situation, and I was just doing my best, and now I'm starting to realize what I was doing really wasn't helpful to my peace of mind at right. all. Wow, even though I thought it was in the moment or something, yeah. but it's like... Wow. I totally blanked. It's really good. <laughs> it's good. Oh, yeah, because cause I, I think what happens is is then you become like, you take all these emotions, right? And you become empathic to everybody else. You feel things, really, because you're trying to figure out how you're mm -hmm. supposed to be to protect yourself. So it's super in tune. Like, there's this show called Lie to Me. I don't know if you've ever seen it. but And they watch people's facial features and your movements, mm -hmm. and they can tell when someone's mm -hmm. lying or not. And the naturals, they call them, there's only like one in a thousand, are the ones that were abused when they were younger because they not only read, they're, they're so empathic they can tell when mm. people are lying or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I always resonate with that. But what it did is it like, in terms of you, my own emotions, it like keeps them locked and controlled out of safety. And so it's been like using all my brothers and sisters to get in touch with my own yeah, and now yeah. it's me ah! <laughs> yeah 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 you had that you put that prayer out quite a while ago to not have like a conceptual or an intellectual relationship with the course but to, to heal to actually yeah, yeah. heal and then and then it's always it's, sometimes it's not pretty the ego would definitely say it's not pretty once you have that true prayer of the heart like please help me heal me, you know, like Andy was talking about today, that help, 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 help. It's just a revolving help prayer. Then things can start to shake and, and seem to be out of control, mm. judged by the ego as out of control. But then you do flip from upside down to right side up, and then it's like, ah, there's the peace that comes in. So it just takes the willingness. I think that's what this is really all about. That's what your show, From the Bottom Up, is about. It starts off with, you know, current events in the world, and then it comes closer, closer, closer to what's going on, current events in your mind, yeah. what's the top issues that are still, or maybe the core issue that's playing for the day, mm -hmm. and then five minutes before the show, it's like, okay, I have to do it on this. This is the most relevant thing I can do for the whole universe. I don't care what's happening in the news or whatever. What's yeah. happening in my mind is, is where the the edge of healing is right there. It's got no choice. Yeah. For the whole universe, you're doing this healing. Yeah. Well, unless you do you have unless you have something to just share, I have one more. Let's go into topic. the next topic. Next topic. Yeah. Okay. Oh. <laughs> 
so, like, I never thought of this until I was, like, 27. Sleep was, like, a no big deal, actually. I just do my university till 11, go to sleep, wake up at 6, get on the bus, and it was, like, six-year rhythm, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Felt rested, everything. And then I got into, started getting into relationships, and it was great. But it was funny, the last few months or years, I've this, it's like sleep only was good if I had like Emily beside me, or, yeah. And it was really strange, I just would be awake. And so I didn't really appreciate the value of that, and then, until recently, all the shifts and changes, but, but the other three nights ago, like Emily's now back here at Camus and living here, and yeah, we spent the night together, and I slept, like, really deeply. I like, went to sleep right away, right till 7 a.m., which is, you know, maybe even 7.30. I'm, mm -hmm. Normally I'm up at 6, I go meditate, and, do and I just even wanted to stay there. I'm like, oh, this is so nice, it's restful and peaceful. I'm putting those in quotes because I don't know, that's the question. And then I thought, okay, the next night I've got to find out what this is. And so I, I went to bed alone, and, and yet it was like, almost like I was in a dream, bad dream the whole night. Then I got up and I put out this really deep prayer. And then all day yesterday, six of us, you and I and a bunch, mm -hmm. went out and had all these miracles, finding things for the mystery school. So I didn't get the like complete answer, but I, I just went and did a deep meditation before I went to bed. Went to bed and actually had a fairly restful sleep, but I was up at six, ready to go, da-da-da-da-da. And there's a deeper question for me, like the fear of moving in the direction of, of divorce with Emily is that I'm going to be like shaking at night and that's it's a it's a fear and I've joined with Kirsten and just different ones and she's like you need to put out more Jesus pictures and he's going to be your new new symbol and and yet I'm like a little unsure is it is it really time to just be in Jesus and the shake is okay let's face the fear and I don't mind getting up at five six like let's do our work I like that or is it no, I've got to embrace some deep rest because I need that. So I'm, that's my core <laughs> question. <laughs> well, I can give a little bit of insight on, on that in the sense that uh, for most human beings, they can identify nighttime sleep, you know, the body sleeping and REM and so on and so forth, and they don't even think of their daily lives as sleep too. But Jesus breaks away that... Um, distinction and he says no all your time is spent in dreaming uh, your nighttime dreams your daytime dreams I'm not talking about like daydreaming at work I'm saying when your eyes open in the morning in, in bed and you look and you see the ceiling and you see the bed and the sheets that's it's all the mind is when it's asleep and it's forgotten heaven it's all of its time is spent in dreaming mm. it's not just nighttime and daytime the way it works with the dynamics is there's as long as there's a belief in separation as long as there's a, still a belief in in specialness or still a belief uh, that um, Diana was talking about the sacrifice belief as long as there's a shred of sacrifice any kind of egoic belief that's still in there there's going to be terror in the mind and it attempts to displace the terror by projecting, and that's why people have nightmares. That's why people, some people would say, I, I've had a terrible life, I've had all these traumatic events, the relationships were traumatic, or maybe I was separated from my parents and I was adopted. They can say all these things in what we would call daily life that are traumatic, and then some have night terrors, uh, uh, nightmares, dreams. It, the way it works is if you happen to have, a, we'll call them during your daydreams, you're, you're a miracle worker, you're working with the people, things are flowing, 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 then if the ego can't get you with the daytime dreams, it will go after the nighttime oh. dreams. You see, oh. it's going to go after one or the other. So it's a lot of times people who have all these n night terrors and everything like this, and they say, my, no, my, my life's not too bad, I just, I, can't, I don't want to go to sleep at night because the monsters come out and everything like this. And then there's other people who have really traumatic lives during the day, and they have pretty good relative <laughs> sleep at night, but the ego's gonna, gonna project it one way or the other. It's got to use the dreams, and it's trying to displace 
the 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 terror, the anger, all the things onto the dream world, and and instead of forgiving, so it's another sneaky wow. ego trick at trying to maintain its existence, which it doesn't really have any reality. God didn't create the ego, but it's trying to maintain it through dreams, and now it's got two main phases, and it will use one phase or the other. So, perhaps, you know, sleeping, you know, with Emily at night, that's almost like with, with children when they go to bed with a teddy bear, where they have to snuggle on something or cuddle with something. It's it's like a, it's a symbol of, of warmth, of safety, of security, like a security blanket, not no different than, uh, what was that one with Eddie Murphy, uh, Imagine... Oh, yeah, yeah, you Guga. Know, the Guga, the, the blanket, I want my Guga, you know, <laughs> that was good, it was all this uh, security projected onto this blanket, of course, magical powers also projected onto the blanket that his little daughter had and so forth, but we it starts to expand this idea of projection that Projection, as defined by Jesus, is the attempt to get rid of something that you do not want. And so the ego tries to get, get rid of the guilt and fear by having it play out in the dreams, the interpretation of the dreams, without releasing it. So really the, that's how you keep the fear, is project it and see it acted out as if it's real. Meanwhile, the hidden belief is still there, and, and the ego is like a little spider that's kept hidden in the dark. So, once you start to see that um, this is what's going on, a lot of times when people have a lot of things going on at nighttime, they will actually sometimes set their alarm or they will wake up, they will journal at night, they will do all the healing practices that they would do during their daily life. Oh Seeing a therapist, looking at things, watching movies, you know, all the, we have huge amount of resources and tools for the daytime dreams. And then you start to realize, oh, I've got to put that much care and attention into my nighttime dreams because it's the same dynamic. You see, the ego is just, oh, Jason's going, he's not going to mess around during the daytime dreams. I can't, he won't let me do any of that right. there. And he's got, he keeps a nice helper mask and he's going to be helpful. He would never let that anger and rage come up there. That would be too big of a threat. But at nighttime, that's when it, it comes out. But once you start to see this, then you start to pay a lot more attention. You may use that setting the goals section, you know, that uh, Jeffrey and Frank were talking about. You may use that setting the goals section when you're going to bed. Like before I go to <laughs> before bed. Before you go right. to bed and say, now's the time for faith. Like, okay, ego, you've been really getting me good at nighttime. And, and I almost, it's been so intense that I almost need my security blanket, or I need Emily, I need something to help get me through the night, to have a deep sleep. But then it starts to develop a dependency, when really you're going to have to take some of those same practices that you use during the daytime dreams and angle them and say, okay, ego, I'm not going to countenance, I'm not going to give a blessing to what you're trying to do to keep me in the grips of fear. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put as much attention toward the nighttime dreams as I do towards the daytime dreams. So it could be then that Emily or the teddy bear, Emily or the teddy bear, <laughs> it's like it's now like a soother that needs to go. A pacifier. Pacifier. Yeah. Wow. So, how, okay, I can do that before I go to bed, but that's like a long time to keep the goal set. To wake up. <laughs> like set an alarm. Well, me. just like you do during your daytime dreams, though, if, if it's that important, you know, you'll go into that adventure not just to sleep. Like in that movie Passengers, you know, Jennifer Lawrence, she's it's just a great character in there. She's supposed to be going to this far away lifetime. She's giving herself over and she's supposed to be asleep for years. And when Chris Pratt character wakes her up, you know, the rage, she ready, she's ready to beat him with a pipe. How dare you wake me up? And, and when I was watching that movie, I'm like, oh, this sister's got a real addiction, sleep addiction going on here. She's really attracted to that sleep. She's bought into the programming, I should be asleep, and you woke me up from my sleep. You know, there was a, a huge reaction. Yeah. Uh, but, but for all of us, we can start to realize, no, we just have to put the same amount of of attention uh, towards healing and whatever it takes. We can't just 
carton off this seven, six, seven, eight hours at night and go, oh, come on now. Yeah, yeah. I, I just want to have good REM. I just want to be really out good. You know, we have to start to realize that those are perceptual. Those dreams are perceptual experiences. Wow. And they're no different than the daytime perceptual experiences. And so... For those of you that have sleeping conditions, you know, this is exactly what we're talking about. Now we're using the teachings of the Course to, to give a full context of this so that, so that the ego can't hide during your sleeping hours and, and do the same dynamics it's trying to do during the waking hours. You know, it's really, uh, we're pulling the rug, we're, it is. we're pulling the, the mask off the ego, we're laying it bare. It's funny because I never... I, I didn't know until this moment, but I just thought, okay, that's my break time. But <laughs> Damn. I mean, yeah. Something's kind of hitting me. Yeah. This is great. It's like a line from Dark City. No time off for good behavior. <laughs> it's cash on the barrel head here. You've got, to, you've got to pay just as much attention to your mind during the nighttime as you do during the day. That's and funny. think about the, the, the waking sleep. Lucid dreamers, you know. What, what is a lucid dreamer but one who can be aware of dreaming? You know, that could be a goal for your nighttime dreams, instead of just like, whack, knock me out and, and let me wake up rested and energized seven or eight hours later. It can be more like, oh, I, I like to go in to have some lucid dreaming, like work with the Holy Spirit and Jesus to say, help me have a dream to start off with maybe even one dream at night where I'm aware that I'm dreaming. And then you do have that experience because it's what you asked for and you're so empowered. Like you're, whatever the things that were scaring you, uh, you're having a, the, a good laugh or smile at it like, oh, I see, I'm dreaming this. So like um, lucid meaning you can control it or just aware of it? Cause just aware of it, just aware that it's a dream. Because I normally I have zero memory of dreams, they're like mm -hmm. unconscious, so yeah. I, that in itself is a step to yeah. be aware. Yeah, that's part of it, like the amnesia yeah. know, of forgetting. Wow. This is really amazing to me. Yeah. I didn't, it's a whole new realm. Because <laughs> one time when I did have this really, this fear in Sweden, actually one time before I went to bed, I, I just meditated and then I was in such a deep rest, like so restful I would have stayed there the whole night and in that moment I heard this really soft voice and it said now go to bed I was like go to bed that's the last thing I would think of but I followed yeah. I went to bed it was strangest thing I closed my eyes and it felt like half a second I opened them and I was in the morning and I woke up and I was like is that what is that that's not even lucid dreaming that's like zero no time yeah. or something yeah yeah yeah, yeah. It does start to transfer. I mean, within the last couple of weeks when I was over, I got was here and uh, I had a call with Frances and uh, she told you she had had a dream oh, yeah. with me in and it was at some kind of a bank and we were on the floor but we were so in love on the floor of the bank and she just was giddy. She woke up just so full of love and then it just broke through into her daytime dreams, you know, she was telling people about it, she was feeling gushing <laughs> full of love. Yeah, it, it transfers though, you see, because anywhere you break through, anywhere you break through into the miracle, which is just to see the false as false or be aware that you're dreaming, then that's a huge step in the awakening. In fact, that's, that's what you want to transfer, you just want that to transfer more and more and more, mm. until you start to really come to an experience that all your time is spent in dreaming. All your time is, is in dreaming. Now the happy dream would be a state of non-judgment with that, like just being, beholding the dream. And, and without any sense of judgment, any sense of projection onto any aspects of the dream, mm -hmm. it's very still, it's very calm, it's very quiet. That's what the Course is telling us is the way to wake up, is through the happy dream. But we're just doing, we're doing the bottom up with Daytime dreams and nighttime dreams. We're taking that whole topic of dreaming and we're really getting down to the core of what's really going on. And we're le eliminating the distinctions because there's not really a distinction between what you dream during the mm -hmm. daylight hours and the nighttime hours. It's mm -hmm. all the same. Mm, thank you. It's beautiful. <laughs> Demystifying. <laughs>
dreaming. Thank <laughs> <laughs> uh, Okay, well, I... I mean, my mind's blank now. No, Emily's in the room here. No, no. okay. Well, what, where are we at? Does any, just be a, what time is it? Quarter to one. Quarter to one. We could see if anybody yeah, has any questions you want to raise. there's any callers <laughs> from around the world. Virtual or... That was beautiful. Yeah, Mary, Mary Straub is there with you. Okay. Go ahead, Mary. Oh, hi, Kai. Uh, oh, my goodness. <laughs> Um, this is, this has been an amazing, um, uh, let's see, I can't, I can't see. We can see All you. I see is the, I see the top of Jeff's head. <laughs> 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 okay, now I see you guys. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, wow, uh, this is so beautiful, so powerful. This has been a really big wow, and there's been a lot of participation on, from the participants, and everybody's feeling this connection and, and power coming from um, so much um, uh, the, of the, the depth of this. And um, I need to, um, I, I just I just have this calling to express, um, I'm hearing myself, I'm getting some feedback. Um, but, uh, uh, <laughs> well, let, let me just, say what's coming up and 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 because it's a it's like the, a, a day to, when you talked about daytime dreaming um it's like i had a a, a nightmare a daymare yesterday daymare. um when i went to a conference and there was a lot of course and miracles people that spoke about course and miracles but it, i didn't feel any course and miracles there and um the last speaker was marianne williamson and um oh my goodness it, it was so challenging for me because it felt like a big huge guilt trip a big huge um um jump into the illusion of all this is real and you know you need to be involved in this and and i was i was like almost angry and i wanted to leave but i couldn't really get out um but I found myself um, wanting to look up like some David quotes that I've got, you know, there is no such thing as social justice and, and, you know, the things that I, I'm knowing for myself now. Um, and, and it's just, it was just really interesting because there was just this huge, enormous applause at the end. And then, and then online on Facebook, so many of the people, and these were my people, these were people that I, that I went to church with and love. And do love, um, and they were expressing how Marianne Williamson just really brought it home, and how she was on fire, and how grateful. and And I, I feel strange talking about this, but it, what I'm bringing up is is my judgment and my projection onto her. What was going on in me that I I was so angry that she, it felt like she was. Um, um, uh, demonizing almost the course in mirror. I mean, it's like, I don't know. It just felt so strange. And then when I came home, um, I had some physical things go on that were really scary. And my husband even wanted to take me to urgent care. And I, I talked him out of it, tried to call my doctor and all these things. And then I went to sleep and had those night a nightmare, you know, a night of nightmares. And I have been since I left Utah in this place of just the field, 
of seeing this, um, you know, the, the, there is no right, there is no wrong, there just is, and the beauty of it all. And so it's like kind of strange to me that, that I, you know, I, I just felt like so ready to embrace whatever happened and accept and, and but I, I had so much judgment and, I, and so much um, resistance come up and, um, and then the nightmares and the physical thing and it's, you know, a lot, of, a lot of scary stuff. So I was like, wow, what's up with that? And so I love hearing, you know, the expressions from Jason and then listening to Calico about the, the physical things and, and the levels of mine and that really got me. And so that helped a lot. You know, but I, I thought this is just too big an opportunity. I'm putting this out here. So here I am. I don't even know what my question is, but um, um, I'm feeling, you know, that there's something in here that that um, you can help me with. <laughs> so that's about mm. it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's beautiful. Actually, uh, we had a little bit of this discussion when we went to see mm -hmm. the, the movie yesterday about Pope Francis and it started off all about St. Francis and then Pope Francis and then uh, a man of his word. And um, But I think that what's coming to me is um, there's a part in A Course in Miracles where Jesus says there, is, there comes a time when childhood toys must be put, put by, put aside. And I think you, you have to start to realize as your mind starts to expand and open up that a lot of the symbols that served you well, uh, like we could start off with childhood toys. I'm sure, Mary, you had childhood toys uh, like Jason did, I did. I can sit down and probably name my tricycle and I, I can name the, the pets I had and the stuffed animals and I even had little troll dolls. I mean, I could go through that and they were all part of my childhood. And then as I grew over, older into childhood and then into adolescence, a lot of those toys uh, were, were laid aside. And uh, when you start to go into mysticism, when you start to go into the field uh, in a direct yeah. way, uh, lots of toys will fall away. Uh, I think for me, um, I can say watching the movie of the Pope, it was like, it was just cute, it was adorable. I, I, I couldn't even see things of, um, of sacrifice or guilt or sin. Uh, when I watched that movie, I, there was no uh, Catholicism. I wasn't seeing any of that because those things had been so rinsed from my mind that I was just seeing this sweet, adorable face and and I, if if I had said the word Pope, I would have spoke it with such adoration. Oh, the Pope is just so cute, absolutely cute, going in that little Pope mobile and and touching people and laying hands on people and I could just to me it was just this, a beautiful symbol of all this love uh, pouring out where, wherever he seemed to go, whatever he seemed to do, and. Uh, and I feel like that's it. Go, it's the same with like even your Course in Miracles symbols. You know, you, you know, Jesus says, "Remember, only the loving thoughts are true, and everything else is is a call for healing and for help for one's own mind, not, not to have people to get the right theology or people to uh, demonstrate yeah. the right things." You know, those were part of our childhood toys and. Uh, and even so beautiful that you bringing up Marianne in, in the conference because, you know, re remember only the loving thoughts are true. Mm -hmm. Remember all the people that, that came into the Course uh, seemingly through uh, Return to Love. Uh, remember those appearances on Oprah and, and yeah. the Course uh, going out. People had never even heard of A Course in Miracles then you can start to come back into that sense of love and generosity and happiness and gratefulness for, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. those even, those, 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 that book, those appearances on Oprah and everything, there's so much love that was behind that, that, that is having a great impact, we could say, and, and then childhood toys can be put aside. Uh, just like 
Jesus had to put aside probably some of the, the Old Testament scriptures when he went off to the mount to pray and commune with God. Uh, he would even tell the apostles, you know, pray. Uh, while I'm gone, while I go off to the mount to pray, then you pray. And watch your mind. Pray and keep your lanterns lit. You know, he was using beautiful symbols there to, to stay high, stay in the light. Don't, don't look back. Um, don't, don't try to carry anything from your past. Where you're going is, is holy. And you need to keep going and ascending in this light and love. And you need to just let that come to you. And so, you know, some of you know even my experience with these. I, I love these Course in Miracles conferences. I started going to Course in Miracles conferences in 2007 and, and spoke and shared over and over, every, every year, every other year, and I just would show up just to pray and let my light shine and to let my lo love radiate to everyone that I met. But it wasn't so much for me about speaking or, or hearing uh, lectures or listening to people. I even remember Jason, uh, I think, wasn't it 2007? Jason came and, and our friend Jeffrey, mm -hmm. uh, came and we were way up at the Holiday Inn, up at a, a way up, I don't know what floor, 20 something, yeah. way up. And then uh, w we were in such an experience there. I was on a bed, Jeffrey was on a bed, and then we had a little space between our beds and, and we put some, some sheets and some pillows down there and Jason was in between us, way up at the Holiday Inn at this Course in Miracles conference. And Jason was so curious, he was like asking, we were having sessions up there in the hotel room, very deep, profound sessions. In fact, Jason wasn't going to any of the, the conference uh, sessions. He was staying up there in the room with Jeffrey and I, and, and we were having these deep sessions, and, and day was going by, and then another day. So finally, I think on the final day, Jason thought, I should at least go down and and listen to one session. I mean, I'm at a Course in Miracles conference and there's all these said I should at least attend one session. So he said, okay, go ahead. So he got in the elevator, he went down, and the person giving the session, who, who I knew, got into an argument with one of the Course in Miracles students in the audience, and they were screaming at each other, and Jason scurried right back into the <laughs> elevator and came up and holding his hands like, Oh my God, I went to one session, and they were screaming at each other at a Course in Miracles conference. He, he was just like rock. We said, well, come on back. We went back into the deep experience we were having in the room. And, and you know, so he's been to some other conferences too, but I think maybe more to, to give and to shine yeah. instead of to like listen. I, I mean, my last conferences, I don't know, for, for maybe the last... Uh, decade or so, I basically am such a, in such a prayer and deep meditation that I, I, I'll go out every once in a while when Jesus has me go out, but I'm in such a state of glory that I, I don't really need to listen to the talking heads uh, uh, talk and everything because my experience goes so far beyond the talking heads that when I do show up, I'm there, they're just to radiate and to shine. And there comes a time when childhood toys mm -hmm. should be laid by. Uh, when you go more into mysticism, you just have to be kind with your mind, Mary, and just say, I don't have to try to reconcile between what I did in the past or or what seems to be helpful, even helpful symbols. Those symbols can can drift away. I, I know even with Course in Miracles students I've known and, and teachers and everything, it all just kind of fades away in the end. And you just go into these this love and light experience where you, you just have to say bye-bye to some of these symbols. Thank you for for your service in in use by the Holy Spirit, but I'm not attached to, to any of the symbols. So I'm glad you're bringing this up because uh, I know there are people that even will watch this on YouTube, uh, watch the replay uh, like Calico was talking about, and pause it and go, did I just hear that? Are, are some of these toys that I'm to lay aside? Even your course book eventually uh, is going to be like a toy 
that your mind has no need of anymore. It may not be for a while, but but the, everything in form eventually, uh, you know, fades away because the light in our mind is who we are, and and we have to be very attentive to that love and that light. Mm. Yeah. Great, great memories. <laughs> And it, the talk was called, What is Enlightenment? <laughs> Jason comes back, what, is, what does the screaming match have to do with the talk on what is enlightenment? <laughs> How does that uh, work together? I, I said, no, they don't fit together. He said, All right, okay. Then. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Yeah, thanks, Mary. Blessings. Okay, anybody else have anything to... Say. Emily's here. You guys could go on for another hour. <laughs> another hour. <laughs> I'm sure the uh, home audience would be thrilled. Unless <laughs> she's got an open invite. She is more than a sleeping toy. <laughs> she is much, much more. <laughs> as soon as I said it, I knew I was going to get in trouble for the chair. Oh, I can, I can go guy. out. I think Emily can come and take my place. <laughs> I'll just take my water. <laughs> oh, sweet. Do I need? A, does she need a microphone? No, nope, she'll be good. She'll be good, right there. Okay. <laughs> Stay close, David. <laughs> Which camera? <laughs> Do I look in? Ah, uh, that's your main camera, but the center, the center, the center one. one. Okay. Okay, You're well, welcome. we definitely didn't plan this. <laughs> <laughs> welcome from the bottom up. <laughs> I've been, I've been trying for weeks to have Emily come on the show, but she's been up there in mystery school and pouring her heart into her function, and then, yeah, just kind of came to a point where we had to come together to really finalize the last paperwork and the phases of the divorce and, and really that wasn't even it because you had a prayer to feel that this wasn't something that was being done to you because we had this experience up there at Daniel's Summit which was a halfway meeting point between the monastery and Camas that we were in all this love and all this joy which I shared on one of my other shows that you weren't on but David walked out of the room to see if you were coming but you were you were Wonder Woman, giving all this sharing at the Mystery School. And so I think you had this prayer to go into that experience over and over again so that you could feel it was part of an expansion and not, yeah, not something being done to you, but your own choice. And I think the last few days when you first came here, you were kind of like, no, this, some, some part of my mind believes this is being done to me. And yet, how, maybe you could share how has your prayer been answered? I don't even know what the emotion is. I don't know if it's like sadness or gratitude, actually. But I, I do feel like I'm coming into like this awareness that it is what I want. And um, it's like there's a splish. I, like I feel like there's an expansion in my mind with the thought of letting you go and letting go of the, the marriage symbol because I can see that it, um, Like there's a holding back because of it or something. And uh, so when I let my mind go to like releasing that, I can feel like something wants to open up. I don't even know what it is. So yeah, that, that was my prayer, that that would be more like the consistent experience. But it's, there's still a split like my mind can go to, I'm losing something, <laughs> I'm losing you. Like losing the love, and um, <laughs> it's like that feels really painful. But actually, the most painful thing is when I question it, when I think that uh, 
something's gone wrong or yeah it's being done to me or it's not what I want and it's like the doubt in the mind is actually the most painful thing it's like I'm lost in that and then I'm actually really grateful when you reflect back now this this is for both of us to expand and there's a strength there and I can link up with it mm. even if I fight it I feel like mm. when I can get there I'm really grateful mm. we're back in love again yeah and that's the confusing thing because I feel like we're more in love than ever and then then the mind goes to what the hell why are we getting divorced <laughs> don't understand but just even what David was saying just there was really helpful like because I have that experience with you as well like something like relaxes in me when I'm close to you or like I yeah I can hold you or whatever it's like something relaxes and and I did have like such a restful night with you the other night but it's like just hearing David speaking like there's something deeper like actually it's been used for the last few years as a really loving symbol like it's been really helpful like that safety mm -hmm. and now it's come to the point where we can't go deeper like holding on to that or something mm -hmm. so I could just feel yeah like every day there's something new where yeah something's opening up and I can see where wow, this is this is the most loving thing, actually. Mm. So, yeah, so the mind's kind of like flipping back and forth. Luckily, in this moment, <laughs> it's like this is the experience, and yeah, I just want that to be consistent. And I want to stay in love. I don't want to get stuck in like projection or anger. It's like so painful. Like, there's nowhere to go with that mm -hmm. or something. It's like a lockdown. Yeah, the victim. Because I've been watching, I could, it's most amazing because my inspiration was that I'd be able to collaborate more with Emily if some kind of lockdown or maximization happened with the concept of relationship. And I thought that would be months down the line. But somehow it just got orchestrated where Emily got pulled out of, the, out of the mystery school, sent down here, and as part of my original prayer, oh my God, wow, I don't know, it just hit me. Because I was having that prayer on the show about how does the ministry turn with the communication and Jesus is already answering it. That's partly why Emily's here now. She's helping me communicate with the communication overseers and we have ninjas and, and different ones to just keep expanding communication and having been married to me for a while and a ninja and living in the ministry, you're a great communicator and we've had to deal with my free expression <laughs> so you you yourself are just really communicating I feel and yeah it's a what well, it's a good answer to my prayer and the collaboration is happening now it's happening now as as we embrace the divorce the more love's coming in and then we can actually do things that we were never able to do in my perception you would always you're making me wrong and I'd be like no I just want to do this with you you know and, and now we're able to do that and have meetings and share and even go out in the day and you know when the attachment starts to come in we have an open talk about now we got to move in that direction and and every time the mind starts to think oh if, if we're supposed to be together it's like the love just disappears because the concept of together is no longer helpful we're, we we want to be together mm -hmm. truly in mind and so i'm kind of that's my experience of it and, mm -hmm each day is like a surprise oh where are we what's happening it's like yeah. yesterday when i said to you like i like i just like i feel so in love with you and then i questioned like why are we getting divorced and you said we're in love because we're following the guidance and really felt that it was like okay well then that's what I want. I want the guidance more than I want you. Uh -huh. <laughs> like I want, I want whatever keeps the heart yeah, open, yeah. but the mind comes in so quickly and associates it, like to form. Mm. Like the love is really about you. Yeah. That's what's kept me going with it. 
knowing that it's about this expansion. You asked David a question yesterday. You said, "You said, but why was the marriage so short? It's like the shortest marriage. We failed. <laughs> we failed. It was like, well, it's three and a half years or two and a half plus a year. And I don't know, he, I, my thought was actually we collapsed time. We've succeeded so well that the dynamics that needed to be healed are healed. That's my feeling. And then David even took it a step further and said that it's not so. Jesus isn't really concerned about time or how long marriages are. He's concerned with is the symbol expansive now? And I could feel when he asked you that question and I heard my own answer. It was like, no, the symbol is not helpful now for expansion. And it's that simple. And so it's like, okay, then let's let it go. Mm. And we had this kind of a mir miracle, the, the first day of her prayer, show me this is all good. I don't know, somehow we had this really deep talk and then I really wanted to go see this movie called Alpha and so it would have left us with half an hour of dinner. But we joined with everybody and it turns out we had to give this talk at 9 o'clock at night about all the 25 people coming down from the mystery school. So I was like, well, I'm not going to be able to see my movie. And Emily's like, I don't even want to see that movie. So we canceled the movie and David made some <coughs> comment because we are going to go to Subway. Like, this is your celebration of divorce dinner. You can't go to Subway or something. So we... We, we just, said, you're not divorced yet. You can go to a nice restaurant. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you can go to a nice restaurant. So we went out to TJ Maxx, got some things we needed. It's really beautiful and joyful. And then, But we ended up, because we spent so much time on TJ Maxx, not having that much time before. We said, okay, Jesus, make it obvious. And we ended up at this normally inexpensive Italian restaurant. Par front parking space was open up. We went in. It was Thursday night specials. They had $5 Caesar salads, $5 meals, five dollar wines, five everything was five dollars. So we said, well, duh, 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 duh. and then we still wondered if we should cancel the meeting, unless they bring it out right away. And by the time we were done our conversation, they just came out with all the meals. It was just this amazing and you Italians are most favorite meal out on the patio. It was just like you're like, we're in love again. Why are we getting <laughs> <laughs> It's a theme. <laughs> it's a theme. But it was just Jesus showing like when you keep following my guidance, everything is so simple. And easy. And I think he's going to keep heaping these witnesses as long as we mm. move in that direction to show that there's no loss. You know, there's mm. no. It's for yeah. It's for me too, because Emily would say to me, "It's just me going through things. What about you?" But yeah, I mean, you already heard my fears with the, the nighttime. But to, for me to just be convinced I'm completely in in Jesus's plan, it's so reassuring. It's, mm. Yeah, it is really amazing to see that the love comes from following the guidance. It's like, I think I'm just like seeing that in a deeper way. So. The, the word divorce has to be retranslated because we watched this. Some of you, we could maybe post it somewhere, but they have these. The question is, are you willing to have a divorce ceremony? And it's this couple comes together and they film the whole thing with all their friends and family around and they cut this artwork and then the family and friends put it back together and there's a clapping and a love and lots of emotion and yeah we were just saying like David and Kirsten why have we not done this before but the, the endings as guided by Jesus have to be just as much celebrated as the comings together like it's it is the hierarchy as if one means something and the other doesn't that so Emily's doesn't like all of that, but we're working on that. We feel the video, so we're we're open to a video. So we're seeing. Yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it's been a joyful ride, and the lessons keep coming. Yeah, I love you. Yeah, I love you too.
Okay, thank you everybody for yeah. joining us on another episode of From the Bottom Up. It's full of surprises. <laughs>